Hello, everyone. Good morning. How are you? Hi, morning. Um, I'm good. How are you? Fine. Thank you very much. Uh, so welcome to this new semester and new class. <clears throat> I hope you will enjoy it. Okay, so I think there are 16 students enrolled in this class, so maybe we can wait a couple more minutes. Anyway, let me share my screen. Okay, let me know when, when you can see my screen. <clears throat> yes, so we can see your screen. Sure, great. Okay, so hello everyone once again. And um, just give me a second. So can you see this um, um, course syllabus, course outline? Yeah, I can view it. Sure, great. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for joining this class. Um, I'll be teaching this course CS560, Introduction to Algorithms for this uh, semester. And uh, my name is Shahid Hussain. I'm a new faculty member at IBA. So this is my first regular semester. So I joined in summer. Uh, and this is my first regular semester. And uh, my, I mean, my research interest and my uh, area of study is basically uh, algorithms. So this is my, my area of uh, research and interest. Uh, and I've been teaching this course for over maybe 10 years now, maybe more than, not exactly this course, but, uh, but courses at, uh, around and about uh, algorithms for like maybe, 15 years now. And um, uh, so, so this is my research interest and this is my idea. So I, I really like uh, this, this field and I like to teach uh, about algorithms. So I hope that we will enjoy uh, this course. So this is uh, some, um, I mean, some logistical information about this course. Um, so I'm not sure, I think all of you are first semester students, first semester students in MSDS, is that mm -hmm. true? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Great. Uh, so have you been uh, to IBA before or this is the first time you are at IBA? <clears throat> my first time. Okay, great. Uh, this is my first time also. This is my okay. first time as well. Great. Uh, okay, fine. That, that's great. Uh, we will uh, explore a lot of things together because uh, so many things are also new for me. And uh, yeah, we will explore them together. Um, so we, we have this class, CSE 560, uh, Introduction to Algorithms, and we will have two lectures per week, uh, and, and they will be on Mondays and Wednesdays. I think you already know about it, and we will meet for one hour and 15 minutes uh, each time. Uh, it's a three plus zero course, so uh, for the entirety of semester, we will be having uh, this schedule unless there is any, any change. Uh, there will be one change uh, that is coming after one week and most probably from next Monday, we will be conducting these classes in person on campus. Um, so that's great. Okay, so I have uh, tried to put as much information as possible uh, in this syllabus and I will, uh, I will share the syllabus and course outline with you through the LMS. Uh, uh, but there are a few things which are missing from here and there are a few things which will be, um, we, which I will be editing throughout the semester. So you, so the first thing, uh, the rule of first rule of thumb is that uh, if there is any confusion about any aspect of the course, uh, your first point of reference is this course outline. So please refer to the syllabus, refer to this, this document and see that uh, what we agreed on or how we decided to do a few things. Uh, so this is exactly what would be following most of the time. If there's any deviation, if there is any changes, I will communicate those changes and deviations and, and editing 
uh, with you uh, in time. Uh, so, but most of the time it, it will remain the same. So th there are there are no changes. If there are changes, I will I will communicate. Uh, so this is a first course in algorithms. So there is some uh, prerequisite to this course, and I will talk about the prerequisites a uh, little bit later today. And um, uh, there is, um, I mean, for, for the first week, we will ha have our classes online on the Zoom, and uh, you already know the ID and the password uh, if, if required. Um, the course description for this course is, is pretty standard, straightforward. Uh, I will not go into detail. I will let you read it uh, at your own time. Uh, uh, but I can I can give you a gist of uh, this description that what it is what it means. Um, so the underlying um, uh, requirement of this course, or the, or the, uh, what do you say that that the objective this of this course is that by the time that you finish studying this course, uh, you will have a good understanding about how computer algorithms work, how to design some simple algorithms, and if you are uh, required to design a new algorithm, then how would you choose a different technique, any any particular technique to design uh, some solution to real world problem. Uh, and whenever you have multiple solutions for, for any one particular problem, then how to choose the best one. So, so, so the objective of this course is, is basically that. Uh, it, it, every other objective that we will have about this course will, uh, will be around these uh, ideas. Um, so uh, in this course, we will be using programming. Uh, so this course is not a pure theoretical course uh, as uh, is the case with the other algorithms course, which I have been teaching. Uh, this course has an implementation or empirical or the uh, applied side as well. So whatever you will study, we will try to implement that uh, those algorithms in some programming language as well in some environment, and we will do some tests and other things. So you will be uh, doing implementation. Uh, you will be doing a lot of analysis, and um, that involves some uh, math and some other tools that we will learn, and you will be designing new solutions. Uh, basically designing new solutions. Uh, for this course, we have uh, two uh, books. Uh, and the first one is the book by uh, Das Gupta, Papadimitriou, and Vazirani. It's called Algorithms. Uh, it's, it's a pretty standard book uh, on, on the topic. And um, I think you can get it online. You can get it uh, from Urdu Bazaar or other places. I think it is also available in, in the IBA library. Um, <clears throat> so this is a very standard book. Uh, we will not be following exactly all the contents of the book, but we will be taking uh, topics from here and there. So it says the course text, but it's not the textbook of this course because we will be taking uh, different topics from different places. Um, there's another book uh, which which we which we call uh, the name of the book is the algorithm design, uh, which is by Kleinberg and Tardosh. Um, that is also one of uh, one of the better books on, on algorithm design. So we will refer to those uh, uh, some some of the sections from there as well. Uh, there is an, an amazing book called Introduction to Programming in Python. Uh, it's by, it, uh, it is by Sedgwick and Wine and Dondero, so we will uh, follow that one as well. And if you uh, are coming from a background uh, other than Python, or you don't have uh, enough programming background, then you may refer to other uh, programming books. For example, Python for Everybody Exploring Data in Python 3. And there are other books that I, I may refer at, at later point. Um, so, so our assumption is that you all have some background in programming. <clears throat> So the grading procedure would be as follows. So we would have um, around four homework. Um, they will be, I mean, uh, divided almost equally uh, throughout the semesters, uh, throughout the, the semester, fall, fall semester. And, um, but that homework just counts for the 10% of, uh, of, your, of your grade. So you can imagine that one homework is like 2.5%. Uh, then we will have quizzes, and these are the theory quizzes that we will have in, in class. And I will announce those quizzes at least uh, one week in advance. So I will let you know that maybe next week we will have a quiz on this particular day. So I will tell you one week before the quiz. And that quiz would be mainly theory. So when we will start having classes uh, online, uh, sorry, uh, we, we will have start, 
start having classes in person on campus, then these quizzes, quizzes will be in person in, in the classroom setting and mainly theory questions. So, uh, so when I say theory, it doesn't mean that you need to write definitions and, and things like that. Theory means that you don't have to write programs, you have to write uh, math. Uh, then we will have programming assignments and the number of programming assignments would be around four, maybe two or maybe three, but at, at most four. And, and that is 20%. Uh, so it is more than the, the theory homework or the homework where you don't have to write programs. So in this uh, programming assignments, you mainly have to do, you have to write some programs, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's the code based uh, uh, exam, um, a, a code, code weight ass assignment. And then we would have three hourly exams. So this semester is different uh, in a sense that we don't know um, that what are what are the conditions throughout the semester. So it is possible that maybe in, in two weeks time or three weeks time or one month time, we go back to online classes. So in that case, we might not have enough uh, opportunities for midterm and final exam and other that. Uh, so that, that's why we have three hourly exams and those three hourly exams will happen on campus in person and they would be paper, uh, they would be, done, I mean, uh, theory-based, paper-based exams. And uh, we would have three such exams. <clears throat> so these assessment in instruments that we have in this course, uh, including homework and quizzes and programming assignments and hourly exams, these uh, assessments are for you to learn, right? So, so I would um, uh, highly encourage that whenever there is some homework or programming assignment, you put your, 100% effort uh, in solving it before you can get some hints or helps from uh, help from from your peers from other students in other classes or from instructor so it's it's better that you struggle so it is completely okay that if you fail for the first time for example you try to do a homework and you cannot do it, that's perfectly fine and that is what is expected from you uh, so if you can do all the homework and all assignments in the one go then probably we are not designing uh, those homework and assignments properly. So the first attempt should not be an easy attempt. I mean, it, it, you should not succeed most of the time. So if you fail in the first attempt, that's perfectly fine. You should do the second attempt, third attempt. And, and by the time uh, you would be able to finish your homework or assignment, uh, you will have a very good understanding about the underlying issues and, and, and the problems connected with, with those, those uh, assignments and assessments. So, so the first line of uh, thinking is that you should struggle. You should should do those things at your own before you can ask for hints and help from outside or from a, uh, from someone in your class or from outside your class. Or even you come to an instructor to me, or maybe if if you, if you have a TA, then you go to the TA. But but before you do that, put your hundred percent effort. And and if you cannot do that, that's perfectly fine. You can come to me. Uh, you can come to my office during my office hours. You can send me an email and we can discuss and find out the solution uh, together. Uh, but you need to walk uh, the path, right? So I can I can only show you the path. You have to walk, walk through it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, anyway, there, there is some uh, late work and makeup policy. That, that is, uh, if something is due in, on some particular date, then I would expect that you would submit it. Uh, so there is no late solution uh, for anything. And um, so everything else about attendance and academic integrity is, is uh, we will follow the IBA policy. So I would assume that you will not plagiarize, you will not cheat, you will not collude um, and, and all those standards things, right? So I, I would imagine that you would do that. Uh, it's easier to uh, monitor and it's easier to enforce these things when we are doing in-person exams and, and uh, checking and other things. But when it is online, it's a little bit harder, but I assume that you would all be following it. <clears throat> so we will cover uh, a lot of topics. Um, and those topics are about analysis of algorithms, design of algorithms, some programming, and some math that is required uh, to understand all those things. Just give me a second. Hello, uh, sorry for this interruption. 
So there are some students in this class uh, who registered late, I think, and they did not have a link to the Zoom class. So I have to send them. Anyway, so let us resume. Um, <clears throat> so we were talking about the topics that we will be covering this class. And um, so the topics are pretty standard and we will be covering some programming and mostly design, design techniques and some analysis techniques. And uh, as, as, as the topic uh, comes up to us and, and when we find that uh, uh, we, some, uh, we require some uh, math uh, background for that topic, we will cover that math back. Um, so the first week is pretty standard and it's um, the introduction and preliminaries week. So I will be introducing uh, some of the basic ideas that, is, that are required to study algorithms and uh, I will give you some examples of algorithms and uh, we will cover some math. And most of that math will be in the later part of this lecture and in the next lecture. Uh, but more, mainly we will talk about some motivational things and, and, and the things that inspire us to study algorithms, why we should study algorithms or why it is important uh, in any computer science curriculum. Uh, so we will cover those things, then we will start with data structures, and the second week is mostly about programming. Uh, the second week, again, is about uh, algorithms, but then we would have a programming and algorithms interconnected uh, throughout the semester. Uh, as I said, that uh, we will have three hourly, so those three hourlies are mentioned here. So we would have our first hourly exam in around week number five. Uh, the second one would be around week number nine and the last hourly would be in the last week. Uh, it would be either 15th week or the 16th week, whatever is the week, uh, we would have uh, the third hourly exam over there. So that's pretty much about the syllabus or course outline. So um, yes, uh, if you have any questions, <clears throat> if, if there's any confusion, if you want to ask anything, some clarification. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, sir, you said that uh, that you are assuming that everyone has a programming background. So I don't yes. have that. Will that be an issue? Uh, that is an issue, but but then what other background do you have? Do you have any background with I, some math? I did bachelor's in accounting and finance. Like there was maths, but mm -hmm. these things are new to me. That is a little bit difficult uh, but we will we will see that what can be done okay thank you sir. okay so so you will see um, when we are uh, doing this these exercises and and problems um, so maybe you would need to put some extra effort um, and I can help you in that uh, regard but uh, uh, so if if you lack some background then I think you need to study uh, some background material first as well so maybe from uh, the rest of the class, you would be doing a little bit extra. <clears throat> but okay, I, I hope you would be able to uh, cover it. Yes, uh, any other uh, confusion, question? Do all of you have some math background? Yes. So I, I assume that you have all studied some math, right? Some algebra, yes, some calculus, yeah. and, and sequences and other things. So we'll be covering those things in the class as well. Um, but if you already know all those things, then it would be a refresher for all of you. Because then we would not have to go into the very basic details, right? So we could skip some details. Anyway. Uh, so we will we will see that what is the level uh, where everyone is is um, comfortable and and we will go with that. <clears throat> okay, uh, so with that, let me close this. I will upload this uh, course outline on the LMS. I, I hope all of you have the all of you have access to the LMS. Is it the case? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So let me share my screen one more time. Where 
Uh, actually, so the thing is that I like to write on, uh, I like to write on, on board, right? So since it is online, so we usually do not have that luxury. So I, I try to simulate it using some other means. So I'll be doing something very similar. So I will use the digital whiteboard, right? Digital blackboard. <clears throat> Just a second. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So. <clears throat> So I try to write on board. So um, <clears throat> I would simulate it over here, right? So today is Monday. Okay. So we already have seen um, the syllabus. So let us. Uh, start with someone's name. <clears throat> so, so the first question, what is an algorithm? Does anyone have any idea about it? Uh, your your voice is not audible. I mean, it's, I cannot understand. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can hear you, but uh, it's it's muffled. It's it's. Yes. Can anyone tell me if you have any idea that what is an algorithm? Sir, all that uh, um, is a logic behind the programming, and uh, we can say the logic behind the program code or the software that is running. Okay. Anyone else? Sir, it's kind of a logic or a logical piece of code um, with some like processes or steps in order to have a particular like a purpose. Okay. So, yeah. it's any procedure to solve a problem. Procedure that we take to solve a problem. What kind of problem? Political problems are problems. So it, it, if there's a solution, any, it, it can be a uh, calculation. Uh, it can be uh, a function that we have what, to perform. What kind of function? It can be uh, what kind of function? Uh, turning on a computer or uh, Okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. Driving can be an algorithm. Like, uh, know how to drive can be an algorithm. Just a second. So, sorry again. Uh, there are some these calls from Red Star's office. Anyway, so uh, we have some idea. I think you all have some idea about what is an algorithm, and that idea is is pretty much it's almost uh, accurate. Um, but it's not formal, it's not rigorous, it's not, um, it's not completely accurate. <clears throat> In a sense that uh, I think one of you said that it's, 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 um, it's a procedure to solve some problem. Uh, that's completely correct, but the thing is that we need to define what, what do we mean by a problem, right? So we have social problems, we have political problems, we have economic problems. Uh, is, an, is a solution for those problems also an algorithm? We have philosophical problems, we have religious problems. So all those, are, are those problems, I mean, do we have a solution to those problems uh, called as an algorithm? Or can we call a solution to these problems an algorithm? I'm not sure, right? So we need to define what do we mean by a problem? And, um, and then we have an effective way to solve that problem uh, in a stepwise manner. So we have, uh, we can we can uh, mention the steps to solve that problem as one step number one, step number two, 
step number three and so on. And if the number of steps is finite and we can come up with a, such, such a solution, then most rarely we call it an algorithm. Uh, but the bad thing about this definition is that actually about any definition of algorithm is that no, there is no completely correct or a complete in definition for, for an algorithm. So we still haven't figured out what should we call an algorithm. We have very good ideas about about um, what an algorithm does, how to design an algorithm, how to analyze an algorithm, but we do not know uh, a correct or or some some definition which everyone agrees with. So we have some clear ideas, but those are just ideas. We don't have any concrete one final finished definition. It's 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 much like most of the things in science, right? So in science, we usually do not have a perfect definition for anything. For example, um, um, I mean, gravity and, and electron and electricity and everything. So for, for everything, we, we know what is this idea, how it works, how to deal with it. But when it comes to defining those things, it's, it's usually very difficult. Uh, there is no agreed upon uh, definition most of the time. So similarly, for algorithm, we have very good idea that what an algorithm could be or uh, how it works, uh, <clears throat> uh, but we don't have a perfect definition. So most of the time we will have a working definition and working definition would be an algorithm is basically a procedure uh, which describes a stepwise solution to some problem and not just pro any problem, uh, most of the time, the problems that we would be talking about are computational in nature. Now, some curious uh, among you may say or come up with this question that this is a circular definition. And the answer is yes, it is a circular definition because we define a problem as something which, so we define an algorithm as a solution to some computational problem. And when we have to define what is a computational problem, so we say that it is something for which we can come up with an algorithm. So it's a, it's a circular definition. So it's something like this, it goes round and round. So we have uh, problems, we define problems in terms of algorithms and we define algorithms in terms of problems. So it's a, it's a kind of circular definition and it's, it's a bit problem, uh, but it, it's okay. We, we try to resolve these problems in other courses in computer science, but over here, uh, we are okay with that, right? So uh, I haven't yet defined what is a problem. I haven't defined what is a computational problem or a, prob a problem uh, computational in nature, or I haven't still defined what is an algorithm. So these things are something that we will keep developing and keep understanding. We keep increasing our understanding about those issues uh, every day when we have these classes, right? So, <clears throat> so let us start with some something very basic. Uh, for example, if I ask you that I have a number, uh, some number five, and I have another number six, and I need to multiply these four numbers. Do we know how do we multiply these two numbers? That's very easy. We know that five is a small number, six is a small number. So we know that five times six is just 30. We have learned this uh, from our uh, basic primary schooling. And we actually, when we have to find this product, when we have to multiply these two numbers, we did not use any computation. We did not use any processing from our mind. We actually recalled so you might have uh, memorized that the multiplication table of five or multiplication table of six, and you know that five times six or six times five is equal to 30. So you did not do any computation. You did not do any uh, math, mathematics or, or computer science when you come up with the solution. But if I ask you to do the same thing, but rather than two numbers of one digit each, I increase these numbers, I, I make them Bigger. For example, if I say I have a number five, one, three, two, six, I have to multiply it with one, seven, five, zero, nine. 
let's say now we have two numbers of five digits each, right? Now, in order to find out an answer, you would carry out some procedure where you would multiply the first number by the second or the second number by the first. It is not a process. It's no longer a question of recalling the answer from memory, right? There is no way anyone have memorized a multiplication table of 51326, 51,386, or 17,509. So it's, it's, it's unnecessary or it's uh, not a good idea to imagine that anyone has memorized these tables, right? So, you know, so now if you have to multiply these two numbers, you would go through a certain procedure, right? And we learned that procedure in our primary school. Uh, when we are in class one or two, we, we see that how to multiply two digit numbers, three digit numbers, four digit numbers, and so on. So once we know we can multiply three digit numbers, uh, we know that we can multiply four digit, five digit, six digit, 10 digit, or maybe 100 digit numbers, right? Uh, but whatever method and procedure you follow to come up with the product, uh, whatever is the answer over here, I, I don't know. Whatever is the answer, you will, you will follow a procedure, right? Uh, and that procedure is set for everyone. So that is, if you follow that procedure, you will come up with an answer. Uh, if I do, I will come up with the same answer. You do, you would come up with, uh, with the same answer, right? So that procedure is, is precisely defined in order to multiply two integer numbers, right? And that procedure is uh, so precise that no matter who implements it, so in, uh, over here, implementation means who follows the step, right? So it could be you, it could be a machine that does it, or it could be anyone in your class, it could be uh, any person in this world, right? So if you teach them that how to multiply these two numbers and you have to follow this exact method, then anyone following it will come up with the same answer, right? So this is one property of the algorithm. So algorithms are very precisely defined procedures. For example, uh, and I usually give this example in, uh, and ask this questions around it uh, in interviews uh, as well. And that question is, I ask this question. Um, so for example, um, one morning you wake up or one evening you decide to make a cup of tea for yourself, right? I think almost all of us know how to make a cup of tea. Uh, and if we imagine that making a cup of tea has an output or a conclusion. That is, you get a cup of tea, right? So you have a cup which contains tea, which you can drink and you can enjoy. Uh, but the thing is that this procedure of making a cup of tea is not a precise procedure, right? So if I'm making a cup of tea and you are making a cup of tea or somebody else is making a cup of tea, there is a high chance that, that the end result would not be exactly same. It would be very similar. Everyone will have a cup of tea, but it would not be exactly the same thing, right? And the same thing applies to all the recipes. For example, if I, if I give you some recipe to make some particular food uh, and, and, and you can precisely follow that, but it is not guaranteed that you will, your end result, your, your output would be exactly the same output as somebody else. Right? So we have some ambiguity, some uncertainty, and there are some certain other factors which nobody can control uh, because we do not know which brand of tea leaves you are using, how much uh, heat you provided to the water, what is the quantity of the water, and so many other things. Right, So, so there are so many other factors that you could not control, or even if you could control, uh, they could be different from one person to the other. Right. So this is not something that we would do in computer science and the study of algorithms. So all those such things are kind of algorithms because you have a step-by-step -step procedure to, to start some task and end, up, end that task and get some output. So by a, um, a crude definition of al algorithm, they are procedures and algorithms, but from pure computational perspective, they are not the exact uh, definitions or exact understanding of an algorithm. So when we have an algorithm, uh, so for the first part of this course, we would imagine that if you follow an algorithm, then you will end up with the same answer, regardless who does it. And when I said that it for the first part, because later on we will have little bit freedom over there and we will introduce uh, 
uncertainty and we will introduce some ambiguity in, in the procedure uh, itself and we will get different results. But we will still call them algorithms because there's a, a good reason for that. Uh, but we will talk about that when, when we reach there. Okay, uh, any, any questions so far? Any questions? No? Okay, so let's move on. <clears throat> In, suppose I have, uh, let's say I have a number B, okay? And I say it is an integer. There's another way of saying that B is an integer by saying that B belongs to the set Z, right? B is an integer. Imagine there's another number N, which is a natural number. There's another way of saying the same thing, which we call N belongs to set of natural numbers, right? So what, what is a set of integers? Set of integers is a set that contains numbers like zero, plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three, and so on. Set of natural numbers is a set that contains just zero, one, two, three, <coughs> so this is basically non-negative numbers. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, now suppose I say that I have these two numbers B and E, and I want to compute a number E, let's call it A, sorry. Let's call it A, which is this B raised to the power N. How would you do that? Excuse me. Can anyone tell me that? How would you uh, carry out this procedure? So, so you can imagine, imagine mm -hmm. that B is equal to- Multiply five. the same number N times. Yes. Let's say B is five and N is three. Then you know that what you need to compute is A is five power three. Uh, which is same as saying that A is equal to five times five times five, which is 125, right? So in other words, we say that if A is B raised to the power N, this means that we have N copies of B. Right? Right. So we can, can, can you write a program that does this thing? So uh, how many of you already know some programming language? A little bit. A little okay. bit, not much. Not it's fine, Python. but you, you have uh, yeah. some exposure to programming. Right? So, yeah. So what yeah. programming language it's... you know? Which programming language? Python. Python. Okay. Anyone help? Uh, anyone has any different programming background? Maybe C, C plus plus, Java. Sir, I know C sharp and Python. Okay. So that's fine. So let's write a simple procedure in Python uh, that does the same thing. Okay. So that does actually the computation of raised, uh, raising some number to the power. So let's call this procedure raise power. So we provide these two numbers B and N and the output of this procedure is a, uh, B power N, right? So we need to uh, output this number. A. <clears throat> so we say, okay, this we imagine that A is equal to one. And we say that for I and 
range n a is equal to star equal to a. And at the end, we just return a. Okay. Now I my claim is that this procedure translates exactly what we have written over over there as a mathematical equation. Do you have any doubt about it? Or do you understand this code piece? Why are we uh, like I have a question? Why are we adding D again and again? We should be multiplying. Change it. It's not adding. It's multiplying. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So let's see. Uh, we we call this function. with the same thing that we did uh, as manual computation, that is, which means we need to find out what is five power three, right? So we know the answer is 125. So let's see if we can get the answer 125. So when we pass uh, this five as the value of B, so this becomes, uh, this becomes five, this becomes three, right? So once we pass these values five and three as the parameters to the function raised power, uh, it comes inside. It sets a equal to one. Then it comes here, which is the loop. And this loop runs for how many times? For three times, right? It will run for three times. So it says that whatever is the value of a multiplied by b. So we and assign it back to a. So A is one, so A multiplied by B, which is equal to five. So A becomes five. Then it does again. It says that whatever is the value of A multiplied by B and assign it again to A. So A is five, so five times five is 25. Then we need to do it one more time because the value of N is equal to three. So it says that whatever is the value of A multiplied by B and assign it back to A. So A becomes 125. And since this loop, this, this part of the code has to run just three times, it comes out and returns the value of A. Now this A is, has a value which is 125. So this 125 will be replaced here. So this will become 125. And this line will print 125 on the screen. Okay. So <clears throat> is this thing clear? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we can write this code here and let me show how we can do that. And can you see my terminal screen? Okay, so we can write this procedure here, we say raise power B and N, say A equal to one for I in range N, A multiply equal B, sorry. Return A. Now we can just say print raise power five, three, it, it prints 125. So let's change these values and five power four, 625. So let's say we have three power four is what? Just 81, three power nine, right? So, so you can see that it, it goes pretty quick. Uh, so we can do simple experiment and let's say print I comma,
power rays. So uh, it will raise. <clears throat> so so we need, we see that this is correct. Now uh, with this one, when I said that when I said that a is equal to b power n, and I said that b could be any integer, and n has to be a non-negative number. So when n is non-negative number, then we know that n could be zero, it could be one, it could be two, and so on and so forth, right? So what do you think will happen if we say that uh, I have to raise some number five to power zero when n equal to zero? What happens? The answer would be one. Why? Because anything raised to the power of zero is one. Okay, just a second. I think I forgot to share my screen. Okay, so the answer is one. Five power zero is one because anything raised to the power zero is, is one. But the thing is that B could be is B could be either zero or plus minus one or plus minus two or plus minus three or any other number. While N could be zero or one or two or three, just non-negative numbers. So there's a possibility that somebody can call our function raise power with zero comma zero, right? So what do you think would be the answer to this question and what should be the correct answer? First of all, what should what would be the output? From our output will be zero. Output will be zero. Can you follow this? Yeah. Can you read this block of code and think about it? Yeah, we have uh, when we are starting our function, we have a is equal to one. Mm -hmm. And when, when we are going into the loop, we are multiplying that one by zero. Every okay, time but, for the loop. But see, this loop runs for n times. What is the n? Yeah, What's yeah. the value of n? Zero. Zero. So will zero. this loop zero. ever run? It will never go inside the loop. Okay. So, but a will still uh, have one uh, value, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, because it's, it's out of the loop. Can, it can, doesn't can, matter because the loop, the loop starts with zero every time. Zero, one, two, three. When we put the range in the loop, it is starts from zero and then one and then two. So, so I it's think it's not. The zero. So it's not taking any. It's not going into the loop, n because n is zero. So a is out of the loop. So a is equal to one and return, and that is only return at the end of. Or it does not even return. Whatever yes. the initial value of A will be the answer. Right? So this will return one as the answer. Okay. So this procedure, since we initialize A with value one, now since the value of N is zero in, in our particular case, so this program will not go inside the loop because the value of N is zero. So it says that run this loop for this many times. So I can say that run this, this particular line for one time or two time or three time, four time. So this will run for that many, that many times. But if I say that run this line for zero times, zero times means no time, right? So it will not go and execute this line, right? So if they would not execute it, then it means it, it will, the value of A will not change and it will return whatever is the value of A. So this, this will not go, it will not, in, go inside this loop and it will return whatever is the value of A. And since we initialize A with one, so the answer would be one from this line when we pass B equal to zero, N equal to zero. But the thing is, uh, what, what is the right answer? Answer to this zero power zero question. Infinity. 
So there are multiple answers, right? Possible answers. One answer is that maybe it is zero, maybe it is one, maybe it is infinite, maybe it is something else. Yes, anyone who says zero. Can you write it on the chat? Okay, so we have one vote for zero. Everyone, everyone should write, so another vote. I'll go with one, zero, one, zero. How many students we have in class? 18 students. So one is undefined. So undefined will go in something else. We have one word for infinite. So we have one, we have infinite. We have another word for undefined. Another word for infinite. Anyway, so we have mixed opinions. So there is no consensus over here because we have like four or five people uh, in favor of zero. Uh, four or five people in favor of one and some people are infinite and very few people are something else, maybe two, three people. Uh, so the right answer is something else. And that is zero divided by zero is undefined. Okay, so we do not define what is zero divided by zero, uh, zero power zero, right? So. It is very similar to the question of some number a or x uh, divided by zero. It's very similar to that. So we do not de define division by zero. Similarly, we do not define zero raised to the power zero. Uh, why do we do that? Uh, I think we should leave it for now. Uh, maybe later on we can think about it, but zero power zero is undefined. But the thing is that this procedure, this line, the program that we have written gives zero power zero as one. So there's something wrong with it, right? So we can fix it and we can check initially that what is the value of B, what is the value of N, if both of them are zero, then rather than uh, returning one, it can return something something else. Anyway, so we are not concerned right now, but this algorithm is not 100% correct. Or this is very common in computer science and especially uh, all mathematical related things in computer science that sometimes we assume that our program will make these errors. And we explicitly mention that these are the things which we are not supposed to encounter in, in, in the code. So we can say that it, it will always give zero power zero as one, but we know that the zero power zero is not equal to one. So whenever you provide these inputs, um, make sure that it, whatever the result it gives, you, you interpret it, it properly. Anyway, so I have one more question. And that question is, is it the only way to raise power? Okay, and there was some restriction and that restriction was that B has to be an integer and N has to be a natural number. What if we allow fractional numbers? Right? That is, we allow real numbers. What if we have to find out square roots? Square root is a power, right? What if we have, we allow negative numbers? For example, if I want um, negative uh, two power three, then we know that this, this is equal to minus two times minus two times minus two. It, it, it will be computed by our uh, program and it will give us eight. But what if the power itself is negative? For example, I want the power uh, something like this, <clears throat> okay? And this means that it is uh, one divided by two times two times two, which is one divided by eight, right? So how to do, how to carry out these computations, okay? Or for example, if I want uh, minus two power minus three, okay? So it is 
minus two times minus two times minus two times, which is equal to one minus one over eight, and so on and so forth. So how to do back? How to uh, find an algorithm for that? For negative powers, we can just uh, add a condition that is. Or let's say. This is negative. As long as negative, then just uh, divide it. Suppose I want, I want to compute this one. What do we mean by 0.5 power? What is the answer to this one, this question? Under root two. Under root two. Or square root of two. So it is 1.41, something like that. Yeah. Right, that's it's a rational number. Anyway, but how to how to change how to make changes in our program to uh, accept this input? How to do that? So we allow it. We say that suppose you have a which is equal to b power n. Okay, and this time we would allow b as any real number except that it has to be positive real number, right? And n is any real number, then we can cal calculate this one using some clever trick. And that trick is, so if I have this equation, I can take log to the both sides. If I take log to the both sides, I know that on, one, on the left-hand side, I have just log. On the second and on the right hand side, we have a log of an exponent, exponent, right? So we have log b power n. So we can use the property of log and it becomes n times log of b. Now, once we log, we do the log, we can do the anti-log. So anti-log in this case is exponentiation. So we just say we raise uh, both sides on the power of e. So we have e here and we have e here. So it will cancel out. So we have a is equal to e power n log b. Now this will work for every real number as long as b is greater than zero, as long as b is positive. Now this formula can be used to find out any such thing, right? Well, it cannot be applied uh, in case when b is negative, but for every positive b, regardless what is the power, fractional um, or negative, it, it's possible to do that. <clears throat> anyway, we will not go into detail and, and that kind. Anyway, uh, it, so the more, more important question is that, suppose I have some problem P. I don't know what problem is that. Suppose we have a problem P. And for this problem P, we have a solution which we call A. We have another solution which we call B. We have another solution which we call C. Or maybe there are a few other problems, a uh, few, few other solutions. But suppose we have just three solutions, right, in, in this particular case. And all these three solutions supposedly solve this problem P. Then how to make sure which is the best way to solve it? So how to make sure that what that this is this solution, whether it is the solution A or solution B or solution C which is the most effective way of uh, solving this problem? How to make sure? Whatever the least number of steps. What do you mean by least number of steps? Um, like uh, we are performing steps, right? If we are uh, raising e, like a to the power three. So if you're multiplying, like if we are running our loop, we are running our loop three times. So like if we increase the number of loops, then we increase our time and we increase our steps. So if we have a way to minimize our number of steps, that would be the best solution. Okay. Yeah, it, it's, it's one way to look at it. And uh, so what, let me define these things. So in this particular course, we would explore many such problems for which we have uh, multiple solutions. 
right? So we would, most of the time we will look at problems uh, which have more than one solutions. Sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes even more than three solutions. Uh, so what, but whenever we have multiple solutions, our idea is that we will evaluate and analyze which solution is better, right? Which solution is better? But the thing is that this word better is not properly defined. What do we mean by better? Okay. So we need to first define what is better. So one possible definition of better is, is faster. This is one possible definition that by better we mean faster. Okay, even though faster itself requires some modification, what do we mean by, by faster? For example, if I write a program and I run it on an old computer, very old, let's say 20 years old computer, and I run the same program on a latest computer that we just found on the latest uh, hardware, then definitely the, the, the latest hardware will run it faster than the older hardware, right? So, what do we mean by this faster? Is it because that we uh, is it something that we can improve our hardware and it will run faster or do we mean something else, right? So, of course we need faster solution, but faster itself requires some qualification. So when we say faster, uh, we mean that, that, that no matter what is the hardware, your solution is better. Okay, so, so let me explain a little bit clearly. Uh, suppose, um, <clears throat> Uh, suppose you live in a building and that is on, uh, and, and your home is at, at, uh, at fifth floor, right? And there's a shop uh, right uh, downstairs on the ground floor. And there's a shop in another street, okay, the next street. And both these shops sell exactly the same kind of things. So for example, if you want to buy something, and, and we know that everything that you want to buy is available at both, both the shops at the same time, right? So suppose you want to buy a bottle of water or maybe something else, some snack, and, and there's, there's one procedure, you know that you can buy or you can get the thing, that object from the shop that's downstairs. So you just go there, you get it, come back, right? Now, somebody say that since you can get exactly the same thing from the other shop, which is across the street or in the next street. And the outcome would be exactly the same. It will cost you exact amount of money. It will give you the exact same result because whatever that you want to get, you will get from both these, these two shops exactly the same way. But the thing is that in order to get it from the downstairs, it will take you less time than when you have to take it from the next street because then you just don't have to go downstairs. You have to go to the next street, you go there, you spend some additional time, you get from there, you come back and then uh, come to your home, right? So we, if, if you ask anyone that which one is a better solution, uh, then you would say that, okay, the solution which just lets you, the solution where you just go to downstairs and take uh, the object or, or, the, or the thing that you want uh, from there is the better solution because it will take less amount of time. But the thing is that this is, there's is not enough information about it. Somebody may come up with and say that the solution that you, where you go to the next street is better could be the right answer. Why? Suppose when you go downstairs, there's always a long queue. Let's say whenever you go there, there are at least 20 people over there. And it takes, let, let's say half a minute for, for, the, for the cashier to, to serve that customer. So if there are 10 people, it will take five minutes before it's your turn, right? And the other shop in the other street usually doesn't have any queue. So when you go there, you immediately get and come back, right? And it takes you two additional minutes to go there and come back. So which one is faster? Of course, the one where you go to the next street is faster. But does it mean that this is a better solution? We do not know because once you, when you go down, you spend some energy, but when you cross the street, you spend additional energy, right? So this, when we say that which solution is better is very, very uh, dependent on 
what do we mean by better, right? So sometimes we need to optimize time, right? Sometimes we need to optimize time. Sometimes we need to optimize energy. In this particular case, where uh, you need to save your energy, for example, right? Uh, so when we, we are dealing with uh, uh, computer algorithms, we are definitely interested in time. Sometimes we are interested in energy, that is the energy spent by the computer. But most of the time we are interested in time. And there's one more thing which we are interested in, which is the space. What is space? For example, uh, I, I, I tell you that there's a problem P and uh, there's a solution A and there's a solution B. For this problem P, this solution A will give you an answer in let's say uh, two minutes. This will give you an answer in five minutes. So which one, which one is faster? The, of course, A is faster. But A will take 10 MB of your space, while B will just take one MB of your space, <clears throat> which is better from uh, the perspective of time, A is better. With respect to space, B is better, right? With respect to energy, we do not know, we do not know how to calculate energy in this particular case because we do not know exactly what P is and what P and B are. <coughs> Therefore, we cannot tell uh, what is uh, exact thing about energy. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it depends on the problem. It depends on the solution. What do we mean, mean by better, right? So in this particular course, most of the time we would be interested in time, right? So we would be looking at solutions which are faster, faster in terms of time, that they perform better. They give us an answer in less amount of time. And we do not care about the space they take. Sometimes they will take less space, sometimes they will take more space, but usually we are not interested. We would be more interested in time. There's another, uh, I mean, and actually there are many other measures which we can uh, think about. And one is the communication, uh, which is mainly uh, important when we have a problem which can be solved by a parallel computer. For example, I have a problem, which is a very big problem. And I, I solve this problem using 50 different computers at the same time. So I have 50 different computers uh, and, and these computers are in different buildings uh, across a building, uh, different rooms in, across a building. And all those 50 powerful computers are ready to solve them a part of that problem, right? And once they solve it, they all combine the solution to some central computer and tell that this is a solution and the central computer takes all the sub-solutions and, and give us a solution uh, to the original problem. Uh, so definitely, if, if one computer will solve that one problem, it will take a lot more time than 50 computers solving a part of it, and then you are combining the solution. Uh, but then over there, we have to talk about communication uh, cost, because when you send a problem to a computer, that communication happens on uh, data cable, data network, right? It could be wireless, it could be cable, it could be some other means. And we know that no matter how uh, you transfer data from one computer to the, to the other computer, the, the rate of transfer of data is much, much slower than the, the rate at which the data is processed on the computer, right? So communication cost is one of major aspect in the modern computer science studies uh, because uh, more and more of our computers are becoming parallel in nature and more and more problems that we tackle require parallel and distributed uh, computing. So over there, communication is, is more important, right? So it doesn't matter how fast one computer solved, but we need a solution which can be done very quickly by all the computers at the same time. And not just this to solve the sub, sub problem, but when we combine the solution and taking in, in account the communication cost, it should be minimum. Anyway. So in this course, we will look at some of these uh, aspects and we will look at um, all the math which is required uh, to, to study and to understand. And we will also look at the programming aspect and we would implement uh, some of these things in, in one of the programming languages that you like. Uh, we would prefer that we do it in Python as most of you have some background in Python, uh, but we will see. So with that, I think I will end this class uh, and I will see you again on uh, Wednesday. So if you have any questions before we leave, uh, please let me know. So
what was that window you were using to write the code in? It was a terminal window, and I was using uh, I Python. So, like, can we download it from somewhere? Yeah, I Python is available online. You can download. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't take. I usually don't like attendance. Um, so I believe in this thing that I assume that you will be present in the class because if you're not present in the class, you will miss the lecture and you may miss other things. So I assume that you will be in the class. Um, and maybe toward the end, I may ask you that honestly tell me that how many times you were present, but yeah, I, I re usually don't like. So I, I will find out what is the procedure at IBA, what is the policy since it's, it's also new for me. So I will find it out. Okay, but keep a record with you uh, that you were present on these days and you were absent on these days because I may ask you at the end. Okay. Sir, uh, yes, please go ahead. I was asking where can we access the recording for the class? For the class? Yes, so I'll. So for the first week, for the first two classes, uh, definitely they were going to be online. So I'm recording the Zoom session and I will post it uh, for the timing. I will post it on the YouTube and I will give the link to, uh, I will post a link to on, on LMS. Okay. Uh, together with whatever that I've written on this board, I will create a PDF file and also put uh, on LMS. So you will get all these things uh, in a few hours time. Because I have another class, and I will fin when I finish that class, I will post all of all of these things on LMS. So I, I believe that you have access to the LMS. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So for those who do not have any background in programming, uh, so these are there, there are a couple of reference reference books in in uh, in this in the outline which which you can refer, and I will find some more and I will let you know. <clears throat> okay thank you very much uh, i'll see you again on wednesday so please take care and okay. good afternoon. Okay. Good afternoon.